Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this evening's workshop hosted by the School of Life Sciences here at the University of Bedfordshire. My name is David Seaton. I'm going to be one of your hosts for this evening, but I'm going to introduce our main speaker in a moment to you, Dr. Robin Maytum. This workshop is being delivered as part of the Aspiring Bedfordshire um, programme and also our Premium Progression Partnership. It's a, a series of workshops aimed at supporting students access higher education, but also get them to understand how we teach and, and facilitate learning within higher education as well. So, folks, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Robin, May Dr. Robin Maytum, who is going to be delivering our fascinating lecture tonight on integrated life sciences. Thank you very much indeed, Robin, and over to you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, it's uh, good to have you all here, and uh, I guess we will push on and uh, start, the, start the talk. Thank you very much, David. So, uh, this evening, I'm going to talk about... Um, epidemics, pandemics and endemics and a story related to the importance or showing the importance of integrated life sciences uh, within the sorts of subject areas that you may be interested in pursuing at university. So let's start the story. The story, story starts with epidemic. This is now this if you look at this picture you need to think about what you can see. What is it that we're looking at in this photo? Well in the background, we can see a jungle. In the foreground, we've got an elephant and some gorillas. The question is, what's the story here? Where are we? What are we looking at? Well, if we look at the elephant and think about where gorillas lives, hopefully we'll get the idea that this is somewhere in Africa. And that's where our story starts. So what is the story? Well, this was some work done by ecologists, environmental workers working, looking at gorilla populations. And this was data from back in 2004 or five, published in 2006. And this is talking about the outbreak of a virus, Ebola, which has killed 5,000 gorillas. Now, this was obviously a, a major ecological issue because you're wiping out a significant amount of a relatively small gorilla population. And this was being uh, or happening because of a virus being passed between the gorillas. So this was obviously quite a, 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 a difficult event and um, an issue that people were worried about. So how is this relevant to what we're talking about? Well, of course, Ebola, as you should be aware, of, is something that also affects um, us humans. And if we move on and go to 2014, we see that in Africa, same place where our gorillas are living, we have an outbreak of Ebola virus, which kills 60 people in Guinea. And then we have this Guinea Ebola outbreak, bat eating banned to curb virus. So the question is, of course, why are they banning bass eating in an attempt to curb the spread of this deadly Ebola virus? And of course, that's because the bats were related to the spread of the virus. So what we have then is an idea that these, our bats, are actually involved with the spread of the virus. And this may, of course, remind you of things which are going on now or have been going on recently in the past with our most current pandemic that we've seen. So we now have a story which involves humans, bats and a virus. Where do we go from here? Well, we're now in 2016 and what was happening is a much larger outbreak of the Ebola virus. And this was the biggest outbreak of the virus since the discovery of the disease in 1976. This recent epidemic had killed five times more people than all the other previous Ebola outbreaks combined. So this was telling us that the things were getting worse and we were beginning to have issues with what was going on. So what is Ebola and how does it affect people? 
Well, the Ebola, Ebola virus causes severe viral hemorrhagic fever outbreaks in humans. It is much worse than the recent COVID pandemic because the infection with the virus has a case fatality rate of up to 90%. To put that into perspective with COVID, maybe 1% of people died. With this, up to nine in 10 people who catch it could die. The rate varies between perhaps three in 10 to seven in 10, but it's much, much worse than what we saw with the COVID pandemic. It occurs mainly, thankfully, in remote villages in Central and West Africa near tropical rainforests. And you can think about where it's occurring in terms of the transmission of the disease and the reservoir of the disease which, as you think about the previous slide, is related to the bats. The virus is transmitted to people from wild animals and spreads in the human population through human to human transmission. So once it gets into humans, it can be spread from human to human. And in 2014, where our story starts, there was no treatment or vaccine available for either people or animals. So if you caught the disease, you had to hope you were going to get better or otherwise you could probably die. Ebola is a very nasty disease. For the first few days after infection, you may not feel too bad. By the time you've had it for about a week, you start to see headache, fatigue, fever, muscle soreness, a bit like flu. And these are the first symptoms. However, it then progresses in a much worse manner. By day 10, you've got sudden high fever. You could be vomiting blood and you are becoming passive as you start to have your body taken over by the virus. By day 11, if you're not starting to get better, things are getting much worse. You will start to see bruising on your body. This is a hemorrhagic fever. It causes your blood vessels to hemorrhage under the skin, you start to see bruising on the skin. You also get hemorrhaging in the brain, causing brain damage. You may have bleeding from the nose, mouth, eyes and anus. And finally, in the final stages, 12 days after infection, you lose consciousness, you may have seizures, you suffer from massing internal bleeding and then die. So it is a very nasty disease. And that's why so many people died from it and continue to die from it. So if we look at what's going on, this shows us the sort of thing that was happened and is continuing to happen in Africa. So if you look at the picture, think about what you can see. What's going on here in this photo? Well, you can see people collected together and you can see these guys. What are they wearing and why? Well, they're wearing full protective clothing. This is PPE at a level beyond even which you got in the COVID pandemic, because they are very worried about the potential of getting the virus, of course. And of course, who are these people sitting around? These are people who've been infected with the virus and they've been collected together to sit and wait outside of contact with other people in the community and in the hope that they will either hopefully get better and of course potentially some of them will die. So we have isolation camps set up with health workers looking after the infected and you're isolating them from the rest of the population to try and reduce transmission. Now what can we see going on here? What do we have? Who and what is the person in this stretcher covered and sealed inside a bag. Well, this isn't a body because you wouldn't do this with a dead person. They'd just be sealed in a, in a bag. You've got handholds in the sides to allow access. So this isn't a dead person. And you can tell by the fact there's a drip here and you've got medics surrounding this. All of course, wearing protective gear and masks to try and stop them being infected by the disease. This, of course, is a healthcare worker, a volunteer, and in this case, of course, an American volunteer who's been taken away from 
the site where they've been infected in Africa, where they were working to help the local population, back to the United States for treatment. Now, I told you a few slides ago at the beginning of this talk that in 2014, there wasn't any treatment available and no vaccine available for this disease. So what's going on here? Well, researchers working in universities uh, had actually started working on treatment with a antibody, which they called ZMAP, a monoclonal antibody designed to block the effects of the virus and stop the progression of the disease. This was an experimental cure for the disease, which had been tested in non-human primates. If you remember the picture of the slide at the beginning with the gorillas and talking about the passage of Ebola and gorillas, they can suffer from it in the same way that we do. They're similar enough that they can catch the disease and they die from it in a similar way. So initial testing with an experimental treatment was done not in humans, but in primates and they had shown that they could stop the disease progressing and the therefore could potentially recover so how is this antibody made well actually this is a case of biotechnology what we have here is a tobacco plant and what you can see being done here is the tobacco plant being infected with a virus which causes it to turn into a, a small factory to allow the production of our antibodies. Antibodies made in a plant, you may think of them as being plantibodies. But these plants turned into little factories could be used to make the proteins, the antibodies, which were used to treat the patients. So we then had three patients, all American, who were taken back to America and given treatment with this experimental antibody drug. And thankfully, they all survived. But of course, this was not a solution to the problem in Africa, because this was an experimental treatment being made in very small quantities in a university research lab. And there were not enough of this to be able to treat the number of people being infected in Africa. There is, of course, the secondary problem that, of course, these people all came from a rich industrialized country like America, where they treatment could afford it to be paid for. Well, of course, in many of the African countries, they do not have the healthcare system where this is possible. Moving on with our story, we now need to think about disease and how we trace disease and how we think about how this passes from person to person and what can be done to prevent the passage of disease. This photo ought to be familiar to many of you who have an interest in the biological sciences and disease because this photo shows something special. This first photo is partly also a story of epi, not epidemic, but epidemiology. This map is a map from London, which was related to work by Dr. John Snow. This is not the John Snow from Game of Thrones, but a doctor working in London in the last century, or actually the century before last. And what he did was looked at a cholera outbreak. And cholera is again a disease, in this case, passed in water. So contaminated water carries the disease causing agent. What he did was plotted where the deaths occurred. And what he found was if he plotted where all the deaths from cholera occurred, they formed a circle. And at the center of this circle was a water pump. And that gave him evidence that the cause of this disease was being sourced at the water pump. Now, back in those days in London, you didn't have water piped into your house whenever you wanted water you had to walk out of your house down the street with your bucket and go and fetch some water and then walk back home with it so he asked the local council to take the handle off the pump to stop it being used and they said well 
surely we can't do that because everybody will be very upset because they'll have to work much further to be able to get their water. But he worked hard and said, I'm very certain that this is the cause and therefore had the handle taken off the pump and he stopped the outbreak of cholera. This takes you to the idea of epidemiology, the spread of disease. And this is a map of the spread of Ebola from one of the African villages, which tells you how they managed to trace how it was passed from person to person and through the local area. And this can be done these days using genetics, where we can actually take samples from patients and sequence the virus and work out from changes in the virus, how it has been passed from person to person back to where it started. So this started off with Emil, who then passed it on to his family. From the family who infected because they're all living in the same house, and this is a disease which is passed from person to person, they were visited by the local nurse because they were ill. But unfortunately, they passed it on to the local nurse who passed it on to the village midwife. The village midwife moved around from village to village, carrying it with her and passing it on to different villages that she visited. From this village, we then had another health worker who was also uh, infected from visiting the village. And as a healthcare worker, they took it back to the hospital and then pass it on to doctors, the doctor's brothers, and other people through the hospital. And this shows you the progression of how it worked through time. We started off from a single infection, and we managed to trace how, over time, and through the movement of people, the disease has been passed from one person to the next. So you need to think, well, what's the significance of epidemiology? Well, the significance of epidemiology is in preventing disease. If you understand these transmission pathways, then you can think about taking steps to stop this transmission and therefore stop the spread of the disease. And so, of course, once you understand how the disease is passed from person to person, you can start doing things like isolating groups of infected people, making sure the people in contact with them are wearing the appropriate preventative equipment, the PPE uh, needed to stop them getting the disease. And therefore you break these links which pass the disease from person to person. So epidemiology allows us to understand the progression of a disease within communities and allows us to think about the steps we can use to take to actually prevent this from happening. This moves our story back to these guys again are zoonotic source of the disease. This zoonotic means where the disease is present in animals and passed to people. So how and why do we get passage of disease from animals such as bats to humans in the background? Well, of course, although it may seem strange to us, there are many areas in the world where bats are eaten by people. If you go back to the earlier slides, I told you that bat eating had been banned in Africa, trying to prevent the spread of the virus. So in this case, bats are the source of the virus, because bats can actually live with the virus, and it doesn't kill them, which means that they are a good vector, a good carrier for the virus, because they can move around, the virus can pass from bat to bat, and they survive they live with the virus like we live with many standard colds. We don't suffer too badly. We survive. We get a little bit ill, but we get better. The problem is when the virus jumps from a species that's used to it to a species that's not used to it, then we start getting problems. So where does this take us? Well, we then get biologists thinking about where we are likely to find this zoonotic niche. This means thinking about where the bats live, because where the bats live will tell us about where people are most likely to come into contact with the bats and pass it on from bats to humans. So here's a map showing the predicted distribution of the zoonotic Ebola virus. And this 
shows you that the places where you're most likely to get the virus are places where the bats live and we have humans near those places because that's the most likely source of transmission and movement of the virus from its animal zoonotic niche into the humans. So what's going on here? What are these guys doing and what have we got here? Well, uh, this is actually, of course, a dead gorilla. And these guys are chopping up their dead gorilla for meat. Because if you live in Africa and you don't have reliable food sources, if you come across a 500 pound dead gorilla, that means it's barbecue time. Because this has a huge amount of meat, you don't have to go around chasing it. It's just there. What's the problem with this? Well, if we stop and think for a few moments, well, we know that our gorillas can also get Ebola. And Ebola is transferred from person to person or from animal to person by direct physical contact. So they've found a dead gorilla, quite possibly dead from Ebola. And they're chopping it up and the fluids from the Ebola could potentially get onto their skin, into their mouths, into their bloodstream, and they could get affected. So this is a case where you need to inform the public that actually when you find a dead gorilla, it is probably best to leave it alone. Because if it's died of Ebola, this could be a potential source of the disease to you. This is the other side of the problem. If you look at this picture and think what's happening here. This picture shows the clearage of jungle to be used by people. At the edge of this, you can see jungle still there. And what they've done is chop down the trees and burnt the trees to clear an area to set up to grow crops and live. There are several problems with this. On a global warming basis, of course, we're destroying the rainforest, the jungle. But the other bigger problem in the taste of this story is this means that people will be living right next to the jungle. And what do we have in the jungle? We have the bats and potentially gorillas which carry the disease. So the problem with this is the land use change and people moving into these places right next to where our bats are living, carrying the viruses, means that people are far more likely to be infected with the disease. So this takes us to the first little break in the talk where we think about what we've learned so far. The question is, so we have this our Ebola virus at the centre of our story. And the question is, what do we need to do to be able to combat the disease? Well, we need people with expertise in a whole range of disciplines within the life sciences. We've talked about epidemiology. We need people to understand the distribution and causes of disease so we can think about the spread of it. We need geneticists who can look at the sequence of these and provide information to the epidemiologists about the functioning of the virus and its evolution. We need biochemists, people who understand the fundamental functioning of how organisms work, how this virus works, what we can do to be able to prevent it from spreading. We need immunologists who understand the immune system, its function, and can think about how we make antibodies, artificial antibodies, to prevent the spread of the disease. We talked about the planty bodies, how we need biotechnologists to be able to grow things like the antibodies to be able to prevent the disease. We need medical microbiologists who can actually do the prevention and treatment and monitoring of the infectious disease. At the same time in the background, we need ecologists who understand the places where the organisms live, how they spread in the wild, how the interactions can lead to the passage of disease from bats to gorillas to humans. Of course, we need pharmacologists who understand how our new antibody based dogs work so that the patients get the right treatment. So we need input from a whole range of different disciplines in the life sciences in order to be able to combat the disease. 
Moving on, information from the biosciences, people with expertise in this area, needs to be passed to a number of other people in terms of the wider prevention of disease. We need to, of course, inform the doctors about how the disease spreads and how it can be treated. We need to think about sociologists and geographers to help understand how we can inform people, our general public, about the spread of the disease and what they must do to be able to prevent the spread. We need geographers to understand where the disease is and what we can do to prevent humans interacting with animals in the areas where, which are most likely for disease spread to take place. We need nurses to help look after ill people and they need to be appropriately informed. Charities working in these areas where a lot of the medical support may come not from the countries themselves, but charities working in within them. Within the countries, we need information from the government, which may affect planning and where you allow people to live. We need businesses and their input to make the commercial antibodies and so on that needed for treatment to the disease, the PPE and so on. We need policy coordinators working with the government to inform them about what they should do. And of course, we need teachers to help inform the general public about what these things are so that we actually get real information past the general public to understand what's going on and how they can best combat it. Ebola is not going away. This is another couple of years after the emergency. If you think about this, 2018, before we were worried about pandemics, DR Congo Ebola outbreak, not global emergency. This was when people were being to, beginning to worry that Ebola might be something that is spreading and gets more widely spread, just not just outside small villages in Africa, but into the wider population in more populated areas. And because Ebola spreads from person to person by direct contact, then the, the more crowded the area you live in, the more likely you are to get the disease. Ebola still has not gone away. This is from the 2nd of November, just a week ago, sorry, a month ago. And this is showing that we've had another outbreak in Uganda. And there's a question in this title off the BBC website, why is Uganda's outbreak so serious? And we have a bunch of healthcare workers uh, working, treating the Ebola patients. And this is because it has recently spread to the capital city, Kampala. And of course, the denser the population, the more likely it is to become a major outbreak spreading from person to person and affecting tens or hundreds or thousands of people. So it is still a big worry and it's still something we need to worry about. So that's the end of the first part. Now, bits of this story should start to make sense of you in terms of things that you should be aware of of what's been going on recently with the COVID pandemic. The COVID pandemic started in January 2020 with a pneumonia outbreak caused by a coronavirus. And in this case, it started off with almost 60 people in the Chinese city of Wuhan. However, this rapidly evolved and it became a pandemic spreading around the world. By June 2020, we were living in lockdown and there were more than 9 million confirmed cases in 188 countries and nearly half a million people had lost their lives globally. Obviously, we now think to think about what we did to how we com and how we combated the virus and how people working in the life sciences helped in that process. So let's think about how we detect the virus and what we did to do this. This is something that you will all hopefully be fairly familiar with. So a brief bit of science background for you. If we think about any organism, their body is made up of trillions of cells. Each cell contains DNA inside it, made up of chromosomes, made of DNA. That DNA encodes genes, which are the functional regions of the protein. Uh, which produce proteins and made up of a DNA double helix. And every living organism has DNA inside it, which determines what it is and what it does. 
This is not quite the same, of course, for viruses, because viruses are only a DNA or potentially RNA molecule, which encodes their genome, and they have to infect cells of another organism in order to replicate. So they cannot replicate on their own, which is why in some people's eyes, they're not a living organism because they cannot replicate on their own, but they still have genetic material. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, or in some viruses like the coronavirus case, RNA, ribonucleic acid. This is a picture of our coronavirus. This is the intact virus with an outer shell, a membrane, and a number of proteins on the outside. The yellow protein is the spike protein, which you will have probably heard about. This is the protein that allows it to infect our cells because this recognizes cells in your body, binds to them, and allows the virus to enter your cells. Inside our viral coat, we have the viral RNA. Viral genomes contain either DNA or RNA, and they need to live inside cells to be able to replicate. This has to enter into your cells. It takes over the, the cells inside your body and turns them into little factories using your own cells for them to be able to replicate. They cannot replicate outside of your own body, your own cells. Now, we can detect this virus either by detecting the proteins, which is done in lateral flow tests, which you should all be used to, or by detecting the genetic material, the RNA, using a molecular test. So let's walk through these and how they work. So this is a lateral flow test, and this is based upon the same sort of technology that's used for pregnancy tests, which measures the presence of a hormone present in the urine when people are pregnant. The idea is that you drop your analyte, your, your um, swab sample material onto the sample pad. This then takes beads coated with antibodies along a membrane. That's why it's called a lateral flow, because it flows one way to the other laterally. And there are two lines on this. Your test line, which tests for the presence of the protein, which in the case of coronavirus would be the spike protein, and a control line that says the whole thing has actually worked and you put a sample that has flowed across. And what happens when you run this is that you should get antibodies bound to a protein on the test line if you are positive for it otherwise you will just see the control line lit up which says that you've done the test correctly so this is a simple test which tests for the presence of a protein the spike protein that's on the outside of our coronavirus and if this protein is present it gives you a positive result the line lights up and tells you that protein is present and therefore there's coronavirus present now, the problem with this test is its limited sensitivity. You need quite a lot of protein to be able to see it on the test line and therefore tell you you are infected with coronavirus. What we now know from working with lateral flows is they're very good at telling you when you've been infected and when you're no longer infectious. So when you're no longer, if you are positive, it was very good at telling you when you're no longer infectious to other people, when the line disappears. It's not so good at the beginning of an infection and for telling the, you that you are infected and are potentially dangerous to other people and capable of infecting them. Genetic testing looks for the viral material inside our virus and it detects part of this genetic material. The various targets been used, bits of the RDRP gene, bits of the S gene, bits of the N gene, and these are parts of the viral genome that are specific to SARS-NCOV-19 or NCOV-2 as it is now known. The way you detect these is you take a swab, you put it in the back of your throat or your nose, you place this into a buffer for transport. The RNA, the material inside the virus, is then purified and used for detection by a process called polymerase chain reaction, which amplifies this up. It now uses multiple targets, the NG and RDRP, and we have a validation to say that you've taken a reasonable swab by searching for a human gene 
present from the cells that you've also rubbed off your nose into the back or back of the throat and put in here to say, yes, you've actually have sampled appropriately to be able to detect this. So this tells you the story of testing and sensitivity. The red line represents viral load over time, the amount of virus you have in your body. And what you find is after you've been infected, this will gradually go up. You'll be able to be detected as being positive for the virus, being infected by PCR because it's more sensitive. That's shown by the dotted line, which shows you the sensitivity of the PCR test. However, the solid line shows you the sensitivity of the lateral flow test, which means you only know you're infected sometime afterwards, normally only when you've already got symptoms. This misses a, a very important period at the beginning when you may be infectious to other people, but don't know you have the disease. And there are also a number of people who don't get symptoms at all, asymptomatic carriers who can also spread the disease because they've got virus, but they're not actually suffering from symptoms. Your viral load will drop somewhere between five to 10 days and make you no longer infectious. That level is being detected quite well by the lateral flow test. And you'll actually say positive to PCR for some time afterwards because there remains a certain amount of viral material in the system, even though it's not enough to be infectious to other people. So how does this all work with PCR testing? What we need to do with PCR and the great joy of the PCR system is it's capable of amplifying one strand, which you would be too little to see on a gel or detect using a lateral flow test into many millions of copies. It's highly specific, defined by DNA primers, which bind specifically to the target and highly sensitive. It's used in DNA fingerprinting, in criminal cases, and can detect DNA from a person down to single hairs or even saliva on stamps. You're down to literally single molecules with some difficulty. DNA amplification works through replication of DNA. And hopefully you'll be familiar with the idea of DNA being made up of four bases, A, T, C, D, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanidine, and these pair with each other in a double-stranded form. So if we have a template strand, we can use a DNA polymerase to replicate and make a copy of this. It doesn't provide an identical copy, as you can see, because the base pairing means what it does is it provides a complementary copy. Every time we've got a G, it makes a C. Every time we've got a T, we should get an A and so on. And this is the way that DNA replication works. So if we understand how DNA replication works, we can understand how our assays work. What we need then is primers, which are capable of detecting a specific organism. And if you look at the sequence down here, what we should be able to think about is if we have the sequence, a cat-cat sequence in this case, we should be able to see where on the strand it would recognize. And it will only bind where you get an exact match. So if we think about it, we have a C, which we should be looking for a G. We have an A, we should be looking for a T, a T, an A, and so on. So if we look at this, we can spot where it binds to. So let's have a look. So if this goes along, eventually you'll find a place where we get our base pairing and we get a match. If there isn't a match, if our target DNA is not present, then amplification will not happen and we won't get a product. So we need two primers to start polymerization, one for each strand. One binds at one end against one strand and will make a copy in one direction. One will bind at the other and make a copy back the other way. And the primers define a DNA amplicon, which is then amplified by adding polymerase. And so what we'll get diagrammatically is a target shown in magenta here, the two primers, and this will form an amplified segment, which is what allows us to see that we've got the target there. If the target's not there, we won't get a product. So how does this work with qPCR? qPCR is quantitative. PCR, which measures the amount of DNA that's produced over time as we go through amplification cycles. In polymerase chain reactions, we go through a number of cycles which will double the amount present after each cycle. What you can see here is starting with one, 
10 or 100 copies of our target, and you can see it doubling each time. This is on a linear scale. This is on a logarithmic scale. So you can see on a linear scale, we get these curves, these exponential curves, which eventually level off as we run out of material to be able to copy the DNA. And what you can see on a logarithmic scale is these look like straight lines until we then curve over at the end when we can't make any more. Now, the big thing with this is this means that actually we can use the number of cycles to produce a set amount to measure how much we started with. Because you can see the more we start with, the less cycles we need to produce a threshold amount. And this is how a qPCR assay is used to detect virus. The answer that you get back when you send off your swab for testing is either it's present or none is detected. It doesn't cross the threshold by the end of 40 cycles, which is theoretically enough to detect a single molecule. If the virus is present, you'll measure a number of cycles, a CT value. The CT value is useful potentially for people working in hospitals, for example, because it tells you the amount of virus that is present in the sample. The lower the CT, the higher amount of virus you have, the higher the CT, the lower the amount of virus you have. So actually the, the reaction tells you not just whether it's present or absent, it can also tell you how much virus is present. Now, there are a number of some there are a number of challenges with testing for virus. And the majority of current testing uses swab samples stored in a buffer that actually keeps the virus alive and potentially pathogenic until it arrives in the testing lab. And this limits testing throughput due to handling precautions which are necessary because people don't want to get affected with the virus. If you've ever sent them off, you would know that they come with a swab and a tube in a pack. This goes into a bag, inside another sealed bag, inside a sealed container with a security seal to correspond to our standard for be able to send a potentially infectious material through our postal system and off to the lab where it's tested. This obviously is a lot of work. And at the other end, when they open the package, they have to be dressed in full PPE to prevent themselves from potentially getting infected. An answer to this problem is to actually inactivate the virus at the point of care where you take the test. You fill this tube with the material which actually will inactivate the virus and stop it being infectious, but still allow it to be analysed and detected. And this is something which I suggested. Um, I wrote an article which was published in the British Medical Journal uh, back near the beginning of the pandemic in um, 2020. Um, and suggested that we should, be, we should be using inactivating buffers to increase the throughput and allow more testing to take place in an easier manner. Um, this was not a novel idea. Um, this had been proposed by other people previously for working with Ebola. And this idea has been taken up by a Bedford company local to the university who are now actually making inactivating buffers. We got a grant from the government to work on this and develop this over the past couple of years. The original work was based upon ideas which were published in scientific journals from people working with Ebola, obviously a much nastier virus where you have to be far more careful on this. The ideas of using this are not novel, as I said. This was published back in 2017 and it's been shown by the workers that actually this allows the samples to be stabilised and the analysis to take place at a later date with the same sensitivity that you would hope for. So we got an Innovate UK grant from the government. We did work on this. Our, our buffers were validated by Public Health England at Port and Down and we did some work this was partly through uh, government calls for development in this area and then um, other universities and places also took up similar ideas. This was a paper published from people working in Ireland who did similar things and this was people working at the Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge who did similar things and had similar ideas. 
we had ours tested, as I said, by PHE Porton Down, and it showed that it worked well and did what we hoped it were doing. So hopefully these sorts of viral inactivation buffers will be around for the future and make handling of viruses much safer as we go forward. Last part of the story. Uh, we have 15 minutes left for my allotted time. So it's time to think about endemic. So we've gone through epidemic and talked about Ebola. We've talked about pandemic with the COVID virus. Let's talk about what's going to happen in the future when these things potentially or diseases become endemic. Um, if you can remember back to February of this year, uh, Boris stood up in power parliament and announced the end of covid restrictions generally there's a feeling that the pandemic is largely over of course this is not really true we still have huge amounts of covid passing around the population the difference is because of the success of the vaccination program largely we now get to a stage where people have been exposed to it previously and are no longer suffering badly from very severe cider effects the death rate has dropped dramatically so COVID is now moving from a pandemic to an endemic disease. The question is, what does this actually mean? And what are the likely consequences about living with COVID? Well, we can learn a lot from influenza. Influenza is a similar sort of viral disease, a similar sort of viral respiratory disease that we've been living with for a long time and has become endemic. It is present all the time. People get flu every year. What does this mean? Well, actually, Flu itself has had proper pandemics. The Spanish flu, which took place in 1918-1919, was estimated to have killed 50 to 100 million people worldwide. That is far more than have been killed by our coronavirus pandemic. This was about 3 to 5% of the world population at the time, and it killed more people than the soldiers killed in total in World War I, which was approximately 16 million. There were three waves of infection which took place in summer 1918, in the winter of 1918, and again in the spring of 1919. And these waves of infection should start to look familiar because we're now used to the idea of getting waves of infection with COVID. So it goes through a group of people, it dies down, we get another burst. Generally, the second one's worse than the first, and then we have another hope. And this is what was expected to happen with the COVID pandemic and has happened. If we look at the beginnings of the COVID pandemic, we can see very much the same sort of pattern. 2020, 2021, 2022. Now, the Spanish flu pandemic was unusual. Um, because it contained deaths of, in quotes, healthy people. If you look at the death rate for standard flu, you see it tends to kill very young people who don't have a developed immune system or old people whose immune system is beginning to decline. The Spanish flu killed a bunch of young, fit, healthy people, and this was thought to be linked to an overreaction of the immune system causing a cytokine storm. And actually, interestingly, it's an overreaction of the immune system. This is linked to some of the worst cases of COVID pneumonia, where the immune system overreacts, causing increased problems for the patient. And some of the treatment is through suppression of the immune system. Some of this was also linked to there being large numbers of soldiers in field hospitals, so densely populated areas where they could pass it from, each, from one to the other. So if we different, think about the difference between a seasonal flu and a pandemic flu, and this is from a article from the US CDC, what do we have? Well, they're both contagious viruses, but in this case, we have a virus in the pandemic case that people don't have sufficient resistance to, and it then spreads more widely. There have actually been several pandemics, not just in 1918, We've also had pandemic of flu in 57, 68 and 2009. The mechanism of spread is the same, but the problem is that people don't have resistance to the disease. And that was the problem with coronavirus. The big solution to these things is the development of vaccines. And this what is what changed the coronavirus pandemic from something that affected uh, 
people badly and we had lots of people dying at the beginning to something that we are now beginning to live with because people have resistance to it. We produce vaccines for flu every year with the aim of reducing the number of people who die from flu because people still die from flu every year. There are a few medications available to treat flu and we're now getting medications available to treat uh, COVID in the same way. The people at risk are the same sets of people. It generally is people who are old and within a suppressed immune system. There is always the worry that, as well as the people with pre-existing medical conditions, people who have not seen a virus before may react badly to it because their immune system doesn't cope. And that's the big advantage we get with vaccination. To show you what happens if we don't get vaccination right, this is an article from The Independent from 2018, not that long ago and just before we got our big COVID pandemic. An ineffective flu vaccine added 50,000 extra deaths last winter. This was from the Office of National Statistics. And what you could see is actually if you look at general deaths from uh, disease, excess deaths during winter, you can see this caused a big increase in the number of excess deaths that you get every year compared to normal levels, which are probably around 20,000 people a year. And this is actually what living with flu means. Although you don't think about it, around 20,000 people die every year from influenza. That's something we live with. And that probably means that we'll end up in the same state with coronavirus. It will stay with us. We will become more resistant to it, but we will still get probably the same sorts of numbers of people dying every year as a baseline. It's become endemic. We live with it. People suffer from it, but people will still die from it. So the last slide. Endemic COVID is likely to be similar to influenza. We'll potentially end up with yearly vaccines for vulnerable groups. We're currently seeing the rollout of booster vaccines this winter for people who are considered to be more at risks. The positive thing for coronavirus is it doesn't seem to mutate to the same extent as influenza. So actually, maybe the preventive treatments will work better and we'll get less yearly deaths. However, the negative thing is there's always the risk that there will be a new strain that will appear that we don't have resistance to in the same way that if we get the vaccines wrong for influenza and then we'll see a spike in deaths again. And that's what it's like to be living with endemic diseases. What are the benefits from the pandemic? Well, the benefits from the pandemic are that we've seen we can develop new vaccine in previously unthinkably short periods of time. The normal time it takes to develop a new vaccine for most new diseases is considered to be five to 10 years. We saw in COVID, we managed to do this in a year. This is unheard of, and this technology is now being used to treat other diseases like malaria and hopefully things like tuberculosis, which kill millions of people every year. We've developed and used testing technologies on an unimaginable scale to help us control the disease. And these things should be integrated into future healthcare systems. This is a particularly big issue with things like antibiotic resistance, which we now worry from. If you go into a doctor these days and you say you think you've got some sort of chest infection, 90% of the time, that will be a viral chest infection. Antibiotics will make no difference to that because they don't kill virus. Antibiotics only kill bacteria. So most of the time you shouldn't be given antibiotics, but very often you'll be prescribed antibiotics because you complain badly enough and say, I've got to have antibiotics to help me get better. Hopefully in the near future, you'll get to the stage where you go into your doctor, he'll give you a swab, put it into a machine and the machine will say, yes, you've got a virus and you'll know, okay, antibiotics won't help. So we won't give them to you and won't encourage antibiotic resistance. Or yes, you do have a bacterial infection, you should be given antibiotics and you're given the drugs appropriately. And this is how this sort of thing will hopefully change healthcare in the future, meaning we get better treatments faster that make people better, quicker, and also mean that we don't use drugs on people where they don't have any effect and reduce the risk of antibiotic resistance evolving, 
which was one of the big potential worries for the future, where we no longer have antibiotics that work anymore. Thank you very much. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you ever so much indeed, Robin. That was absolutely fascinating. I um, really enjoyed that. Thank you ever so much. We did have a question um, towards the start of um, the session. It was from Adam, and Adam asks, um, there was a theory that the spread of uh, the Ebola disease, um, uh, where this came up when you were talking about Ebola, um, is directly proportional to the mental stability of the population. And asks, does this make sense? And does mental stability affect immunity? Uh, I don't think there's any evidence at all that mental stability affects immunity. Uh, you're talking about entirely dis different physical systems. Health affects immunity, mass immunity massively. So if you don't have a good, well-balanced diet, then you don't make the antibodies well. You need protein to be able to make antibodies, which you use to protect you from disease. Also, very significantly, vitamin D has been implicated in the spread of disease. So not enough vitamin D, which is used as part of the uh, immune system, um, means that you have a lower immune response, which is actually why there's a recommendation these days that you potentially take vitamin D if you don't get out in the sun a lot and during the winter, especially in, 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 in dark, cold times like the current ones. So not so much mental stability having an effect, but certainly... Uh, the general health and nutrition of the population will have a massive effect upon the spread of disease. It's why we get ill in winter more often, mm. partly. Yeah. Thank you. And I hope that answered your question there, Adam. If anybody has any other questions, do feel free to type them into the comment box. Alternatively, we are going to be um, keeping this live stream on our Facebook and our YouTube channel. Um, we do have a team monitoring that, so do feel free to ask any questions after we finish this live feed. And our fabulous team um, within the university will happily answer any questions that you have. And very quickly, Robin, um, we've got a couple of minutes left. You are representing the School of Life Sciences here at the University of Bedfordshire. Do you mind just giving us a little brief overview as to what the school is, types of courses you teach, and also talk a little bit more about some of the, the, the research that comes out of that school? So, so I um, absolutely. Uh, we have a fairly broad offering in the life sciences covering topics from uh, biology, biochemistry, biomedical sciences, pharma related so courses so pharmaceutical science and chemistry pharmacology and health and you can see from the talk uh, how all of these different aspects of the life sciences can fit in and, and benefit society and, and, and you know part of the point of the earlier part of the talk was was to highlight that you know we need people with experts in all of these areas from biology looking at um animals looking at the environment through to specialists in the biomedical areas. And we offer a wide range of degrees in all of these different areas within the department. Um, yeah, we have a number of people, obviously, you know, we have a department which is very active um, in terms of research as well as teaching. So we, we like to think we, we have what, what they tend to refer us to as uh, uh, research led teaching. So obviously I do work related to um, viral inactivation most recently i've previously done work uh, which was related to uh, heart disease and genetically inherited heart disease we have colleagues working on things like uh, alzheimer's disease uh, we have other colleagues who, who are looking at um things like uh asthma uh and uh autoimmune diseases so we you know we have have a wide variety of staff working actively in different areas so when students come and study at the university they get exposure not just to the basic academic learning but also people who are actually experts in their areas and doing real research work in those areas and trying to make a, a wider general difference you know again part of the point which i was trying to make is that you know, academic institutions such as us actually have a genuine contribution to make to society not just in terms of teaching but in terms of the benefits of the research work we're doing yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, the team in our School of Life Sciences are absolutely fabulous. And um, some of the stuff that, that you know, they present to us as staff is absolutely it's mind blowing in a number of cases. So uh, thank uh, you. Excellent. And one of the things we're also very good at, which I also think I, I, I hope to highlight, is the importance of 
getting interactions between academia and companies to actually implement these things in the real world. So, again, this is something the government's trying to push and, and, and actually some of us are trying to, 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 to push ourselves is trying to get interactions with companies that can turn great ideas into things that generally make a difference to people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, folks, that is it for tonight. Thank you ever so much indeed for watching this webinar tonight. Um, Robin um, is a, a principal lecturer at the University of Bedfordshire in our School of Life Sciences. If you would like to find out more about our School of Life Sciences, then please do come along to one of our open days. Our next open day for our Luton campus is on the 21st of January, but we also do run weekly campus tours as well. And of course, we will happily arrange for you to meet with our academic staff at the University of Bedfordshire. For cheer. Finally, thank you ever so much indeed for your time this evening, Robin, um, for that fascinating talk. And if you found today interesting and you wish to attend some more of our public lectures, um, all of our online workshops are available for the members of the public, and you can find these at www.beds.ac.uk. Um, and uh, there's loads of subjects there some more from our school of life sciences plus from our computer and our business school um so please do have a look and you are more than welcome to attend those but thank you ever so much indeed for your time and um have a good evening thank you goodbye